Hi and welcome to Griffith University's Open House event. My name's uh, Michael Townsley. I'm the Head of School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Um, so tonight's session is broken up into two parts. Uh, the first part is a, a Q&A session that I've had with uh, two of our alumni, uh, our graduates, who, will, who are also in the chat tonight. Uh, so we have Corey Allen, who is an inspector in the Queensland Police Service, and we have Tali Metham, who is in uh, Queensland Corrective Services. Uh, we've recorded a conversation between the three of us. It takes about 20 minutes. Um, and then after that, we'll have a Q&A session with you. You can pose your questions to Corey and, and Tali. Uh, anything you want to pick up on on what they've said, or if there's something that you are dying to ask them, um, they'd be more than happy to, um, to, to answer. Uh, if something occurs to you, I'd encourage you to type your question into the Q&A um, a s section, you, there's, a, there's a text box where you can ask your questions. We've got a team of people that will moderate those questions so we just don't get duplicates and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. The second part where, we, uh, where you'll be able to pose your questions to Corey and, and Tali and, and me um, will go for about 10 to 15 minutes and we'll just try to do our best to get through as many questions as possible. If we don't get to your question, we're still available on Tuesdays and Thursdays between 4 and 6 and you can ask any question you want about uh, criminology and criminal justice and studying at Griffith University. I really hope you enjoy tonight and um, we'll see you in the, uh, the Q&A session uh, in just a little moment. Bye. Tali and Corey, thanks for joining me today. Uh, we might start with you, Tali. Can you just describe, um, just to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the current role that you're in? Yep. So my name's Tali Metham. I am in the Human Resources Department with Queensland Corrective Services, specifically in the recruitment team. So I started with QCS back in 2015. Mm -hmm. I started as a custodial correctional officer in Waco mm -hmm. in a male facility. Uh, in my last uh, couple of years, I uh, found my desire to move into a more HR space, but with QCS Evolve, and uh, hence I've been in this current role in recruitment for the last 10 months. So my role is uh, primarily recruiting for Capricornia Correctional Centre up in Rockhampton, so I do get to travel quite a bit throughout Queensland, which is great, and uh, meeting potential new CCOs. Yeah, what's the most sort of interesting um, insight that you've had in the recruitment, in, in the current role, uh, what's the most sort of interesting insight that you've had into the, into the, the sort of personal characteristics of some of the people that, you're, um, that are interested in joining QCS? What I found really interesting is that desire from, from people interested in QCS is to make a difference. Mm. So that is a key factor that is always raised by our candidates, mm. is that they really want to help people. Mm. There's this desire to really make a change in um, prisoners' lives, essentially. Mm. Is that they really see them coming into the role as a CCO is, is working to rehabilitate the prisoners by acting with integrity, being fair, firm and honest, mm. and, and yeah, making a difference. Mm. That, that's really interesting. And Corey, tell us about, um, could you just introduce yourself and tell us about your current role? Uh, my name's Corey Allen. I'm the inspector in charge of operational training services in the Queensland Police. I've been in the police for about 34 years coming up, so time's gone quickly. Yeah. Um, my job entails overviewing the development and delivery of all operational skills, tactics and strategy type training to police both as recruits and operationally when they're sworn in. Right, and, and could you just describe for us what a typical day in, in your work is like? So I, I overview uh, a large number of staff both here and around the state and in our academy in Townsville who deliver recruit skills training, recruit driver training, so that includes firearms training, the hands-on tactics training, taser and all the other accoutrement type training. Um, but often my day entails keeping a scope of what's happening in the community and in, in the operational police world so that we can quickly make sense of that in training and interpret what's happening to affect better training. So for example, this morning I usually read the, what's called the QDES briefing, and so it's a briefing about all the incidents that happen in Queensland involving police around the state, and I look for 
things that might help us develop better training, things that indicate whether training's being done properly, things that help us identify trends and, and things we need to react to or respond to. Mm -hmm. And often it's good news, often it's police doing a great job using as little force as they possibly can to resolve really dangerous things. And mm. that's probably the most rewarding part of my day when you see things going well. Yeah, right, fantastic. And, and Tali, how about you? What does your typical day look like? Um, my day is quite varied. So it um, really depends on where we're at in terms of where we're up to in the recruitment cycle with our um, current applications mm -hmm. coming through. Um, I guess a typical day would be a case of uh, screening applications for potential custodial correctional officers that have come through, mm -hmm. conducting telephone interviews with potential recruits, um, and then working with applications that we are currently, sorry, that we're currently working on um, when they've progressed after assessment centre. So I guess just keeping that candidate engagement, keeping them training mm. in preparation for our respond to medical emergencies, which is a, a big part of our recruitment process. Right. Um, and just working through the back end administrative type, mm -hmm. type stuff to do with their applications. And there's also quite a bit of uh, stakeholder engagement with our Corrective Services Academy. Right. So in terms of uh, arranging uh, upcoming courses, so our custodial officer entry program, mm. um, and it, of course with the correctional facilities themselves. So in terms of reaching out to management and supervisors, uh, having that open communication so they can raise with us any issues with any recruits that they may have had recently. So we can sort of problem solve and, and keep tweaking our recruitment process yeah, right. as it goes through. Yeah, um, and I'm interested in when you, so you're a, a, a graduate of our, of our degree, yes. uh, which is fantastic, well done. Um, so I'm interested in when you started your degree with, with Griffith University, is, is this the sort of career that you had in mind? And, and if not, what, what did you think coming into criminology that where you would um, ultimately end up? Yeah, um, when I first started my university degree, I. I guess my vision of where my career would end up was quite broad. Um, I always had an interest in, in the police, uh, the defence, uh, other security agencies mm. and also corrections. Um, I actually, after my first year of university, I actually applied to Queensland Corrective Services and, and I actually started as a custodial correctional right. officer in Waco. Okay. So I spent four years as a correctional officer and in my last maybe 12, 12 to 18 months in that particular role, I found myself really inspired uh, to, to train new officers hmm. and into mentoring. And as I had had previous experience in human resources, when this opportunity came up with our recruitment team, hmm. I, I grabbed it with both hands. And yeah. I'm just really motivated to, to help work towards building a strong and capable and honourable workforce. Yep. So I really... Yeah, I guess my end goal was slightly different mm. um, to what I had imagined it, but um, I think that's just part of life, part of university is, is you learn things about yourself and and your career trajectory just, just changes. And, and I think for me, I think a lot of students are surprised when they go into the workforce how actually team oriented a lot of professional work is Absolutely. and that uh, developing that sort of community practice or, or getting plugged into it is actually quite a critical skill to have or a threshold point I think in one's career to realize ah, uh, actually uh, I can learn from people that are a bit senior from me. 100% yeah. yeah and I can definitely speak to that when with my experience as a CCO there's you really have to take on board others others opinions mm. others uh, way of working and you really have to interact with a wide range of people and, and learn skills from from everyone. Yep sort of pick out what you think will work for you and, and, and actually operate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, thank yeah. you. Um, so, Corey, how about you? When you first decided to do a, a criminology degree, what was your uh, thinking about uh, employment? Um, were, were, were you targeting a particular uh, profession? Well, I was already in the police. And right. I was a, one of the very first graduates. It sounds like a long time ago now, but the, um, it, it was just obvious to me that if I was to get better at this job, it was more about it. It was more about 
educating and developing myself, mm. not only, you know, the physical stuff and learning how to do your job, but mm. I knew that there was more to it to understand yep. what we were doing. Because at that early stage, there wasn't a lot of academic police involvement mm. and interaction. So mm. to get to where we are now, where you know, we work so closely together is testament to how the university's partnered with police. But I found, firstly, you're a little bit looked at oddly when you started to study because I said, well, you're in the police, why would you want to study? But then when we broke the seal and more people started to study, more people started to apply what they learned in the workplace, people saw it as not only um, advantageous but essential. Mm. Um, and in a good way, you actually never stop studying. So, mm. you know, you're always doing something either internally or externally or with the university to continually develop and it developed really good habits for me to think I need to look more broadly than just my experience and my immediate little workplace. So I need to be able to look more broadly and understand things and ask questions about why things work and have relationships outside the police in academic circles and human services and other areas that can help us. And mm. then that really has helped me have a better grasp of the community in which you work as opposed to, you know, my view of the world that I'm walking the beat or doing my shift every day. Mm. I remember speaking to someone who was involved, a police officer in the UK who was involved in community liaison. And I asked him how he came into this, expecting him to say that, uh, you know, he felt it was a subordinate activity, he'd rather be fighting crime. And, and he actually convinced me that actually this is this requires a higher level of skill than the guys in the cars um, and that and this is a this is like probably one of the most important things to manage stakeholder relationships because the police rely so much on on their partners um, it just was really interesting to me as a as an outsider the different um, I guess perspectives on on the roles within within an organization mm. and and I think you make a really good point about study that uh, lifelong learning that crime and the criminal environment and organisations are constantly changing and, and the nature of, of crime and criminality is changing and that if you have a fixed mindset, actually you're going to have limited effectiveness, I think. So how, how have you found that as a, as a police officer, having that sort of, um, I guess, uh, I would call it a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset um, operating in, in QPS? There's a really healthy appetite for looking at what we do and why we do it and then actually asking that difficult question is, is it actually working? Is mm. it effective? And you can't do that if you don't have that wider scoping and growth mindset that mm. you can talk about. So police have been guilty in the past of doing the wrong thing for good purpose and, and thinking we've been effective. So personally, I can say my experience, you know, I was in high volume arrest teams where it, we were really encouraged to, you know, your good night out is you arrest a lot of people mm. and you get some overtime and, that's cleaning up the streets and doing things. So um, we went to a small country town once in this in this team I was in, the public safety response team. They had a lot of trouble with this BNS board before and they said we just need to do, you know, arrest anyone that commits an offence and be, you know, really uh, zero tolerance mm. about it. And in that night we arrested 75 people. Fantastic. You know, you know we made, used a lot of skills, you know, we were all lawful arrests, it was absolutely all the right. Then we filled the watch house up, you know, we got overtime, we got big pats on the back. Now, um, subsequent to that, one of the guys that worked at Charters Towers came and worked with us and he goes, oh, do you know that they didn't have that BNS ball for two years after that? I said, oh, why is that? He goes, oh, they were frightened, those police from Brisbane were going to come again. So it dawned on me then at that point that us doing what we thought was the right thing, mm and actually being rewarded for it. Like we got overtime and, you know, what a great shift. You guys are workers, guys and girls, and we have a good team. And we'd actually done harm to the community. We we had stopped a very worthwhile community event that probably mm. brought a lot of goodwill, probably brought money to the community, probably did a lot of things because we did what we thought the right thing was at the time without having consideration for the wider community needs. Mm. So it's nice to know now things like the Mount Isa Rodeo, for example, was a good, was a good test case where they manage the event together with the community mm. and the alcohol stakeholders. You now they introduced things like mid-strength alcohol and alcohol management plan and they went from what used to be a massive melee with a lot of arrests and a lot of conflict um, to an event that has very few arrests that's very successful mm. when people are active and out in the community um, or because people work together to think, oh, what are we actually trying to achieve here, not you know, what do I want to do because I think it's the right thing. It doesn't matter who you are. Yeah. 
And uh, the times are upon us with the type of work we do now that we don't do crime all the time. You know, we've got a lot of mental health, mm. a lot of domestic violence, a lot of youth crime misbehaviour that, you know, we can't arrest our way out of those problems. So we need to be partnering mm. genuinely and authentically with people to get good effects. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's interesting you mentioned that. I'd be... Could describe for us in your role what sort of new opportunities you see in um, in your organisation. What are the sorts of skills that uh, graduates are going to need in the next, you know, two to five years um, with the with the dynamic nature of crime and the and the business of of QPS. Uh, I take that point that we spoke about previously. It's about working together with other people mm. to get an effect out of something, not just being able to do something by yourself. So being able to partner and work with people, being able to understand what you do and why you do, and even being encouraged to question that mm. and ask, you know, could we do something better? Um, we really are looking for people to have some leadership qualities even at, at every level, mm. because when you're a police officer in the car with your partner, you really are the masters of your own destiny or demise, and you show a lot of leadership regardless of how much service you have by the way you conduct yourself when you're out at these difficult things. You know, you're the police. When mm -hmm. you show up, doesn't matter what's on your shoulder or how long you've been doing it, you are the police. So you should be able to speak confidently, you know, engage with someone and look them in the face. You should be able to make quick judgments about the situations and appreciate problems quickly and be able to understand what problems are. You need to be able to make decisions about things that uh, in short periods of time that are gonna have ramifications going onwards so people will scrutinise what you do and, and look closely at it and you'll also be able to actually do things yourself so if you have we really encourage people if they have good ideas and they have good initiatives or they see a problem and they think I could probably do something about that we're really grasping those people and you know giving them the support in order to do small initiatives and projects that mm. can make an impact in their local area. Yeah great great. Um, Tali so in your role you're looking at um, potential cultural fit, um, a whole range of um, job ready skills. What are the sorts of, the way that your organisation is changing, what are the sorts of new opportunities you're seeing for, for criminology graduates to come into your organisation? Um, I guess I'll, I'll speak to the, the role as a custodial correction officer, CCO, um, and uh, reflecting on quite a few points that, that Corey's spoken to is, is having that greater understanding and that knowledge and that growth mindset that mm. you were talking about, particularly as, you know, society changes and as, as I guess, crime changes on, on some level, it, it, it fluctuates within corrections of, of what types of people are, are being incarcerated. Mm. So we really need CCOs or, or candidates that are, um, they have life skills, they have some work experience, they are able to work as part of a team and mm. identify problems as they arise and, and similar to what Corey was saying is, is, is actually doing something about those issues. So there's also that, uh, the, when you, you mentioned about cultural fit, there's also that having that understanding that the, of, of cultural, having a cultural awareness mm. within the facilities obviously is as most of us all know, that the, the high incarceration rates of uh, Indigenous and uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, mm. you really do need to understand how you can operate differently yep. with the different types of people that you interact with during mm. a shift. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I'd be interested if you could kind of cast your mind back to you know, reflecting on some of the things that you've learned about um, your, your organisation and the field. Um, and if you could have a, a moment to, to speak to a younger Tali, you know, during studies or just before studies, if what what, what kind of advice would you would you give her? Oh gosh, um, I would for myself probably say don't be too hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. I was very much when I first started my degree wanted the top the top grades, yep. um, and I really wanted to do well. But I would say to because I was working as a mature student, I was working full time, mm. studying full time, and yep. trying to have a social life as well. So, I think looking back, not to be too hard on myself, and and actually enjoy the process. Yeah, right. Really get engaged and really involved in what you're learning, and remember the reasons you're doing it. Yep. 
Yeah, great. And and Corey, what about you? What advice uh, would you have for a, for for a younger Corey Allen during during your studies? Uh, it really helped me if I could make a connection between what we we're studying and something local, something that I mm. something real. Mm -hmm. So if I, it, it helped me if I could think I see how that would apply, and particularly because I was in the police at the time, I could see how that would apply to something that I know about or I've heard mm. about. And then um, don't be afraid to actually have a go at something because I've seen so much work come out of students at Griffith that fantastic ideas that no one else is thinking about. Mm. And it doesn't matter what stage you're at, if you've got a good idea and you've and you've got a bit of initiative, you know, don't be afraid to have a go and ask for some support. I know the staff here would be more than more than happy to see someone turn, you know, a, a good assignment or assessment piece into something real. Mm. Uh, and that's the relevance of what gets taught here. It, it's real stuff yeah, that gets yeah. taught that can be applied quite easily when you're in, when you're in the real world. So Corey, your fantastic uh, anticipation. My last question was going to be, what's your top tip for students um, in criminology, uh, which you've, you've already beaten me uh, to the punch. I think that's a fantastic idea about um, just sort of looking at the applicability of your of assessments or the activities that you're doing and talking to talking to academics about where this might lead. So Tali, um, I'll put you on the spot and ask you, what would your kind of top tip for, for students studying criminology be? My top tip would be to seek support if you need it. Mm. Um, I think, and again, I'm speaking as a mature student, um, when you're working full time and studying full time or even part time, and if there's something that you're not sure on or, or you're just struggling with the workload is, is to reach out. Mm. The university's got some amazing services available and just reach out to your course conveners, your tutors, um, or the other areas that you may need assistance. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that ends our formal Q&A session. So I'd like to thank Tali and Corey for being here with me this evening. And we'll now go into the live Q&A section of tonight. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Townsley. You might remember me from such uh, videos as the one you just watched. This is the second part of the Q&A panel session. Uh, I'm joined by Tali and Corey, who you saw in the first video, and I also have a new person, Ria Wong from MICA Projects. Um, if you, and just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, just pop it in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to get uh, through as many questions as possible. Um, so Ria, um, you went in the, the first video, so I thought we might start with you. Would you like to just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about uh, MICA projects and what what uh, what you do in that role. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, hi everybody. I'm Ria. Um, so, I am currently non-executive director and company secretary for MICA projects. So, MICA projects is an incredible non-for-profit organisation that primarily works um, works here in Queensland, but primarily uh, here in southeast Queensland, with some work across the rest of the state. Um, we have a very diverse portfolio, but our key programs would be um, our homelessness services and running the Brisbane uh, Regional Domestic and Family Family Violence Service. Um, I joined that role, I think we're coming up to two years now, I've been in that role. Um, it, it's a voluntary capacity um, and it's something that I'm very proud to say that because my career, the depth of my career, I um, was able to get that role and able to work in that space and contribute um, to the incredible work that the team there do. I wear a few other hats. Um, uh, I suppose my career has progressed to the point that I have complete flexibility. Um, so uh, previously, I straight out of uni, I was able to do uh, 13 years with Queensland Corrective Services, um, working in the community correction side. Um, and after that, was able to transition into uh, specialist domestic and family violence, both in the not-for-profit sector, um, delivering reform for government as well. Um, and now I also uh, deliver some tra training for Griffith University, um, the MATE program. So I'm delivering the Alison Baden Clay um, Foundation partnership training. So I get to wear quite a few hats now um, and I'm very happy to say that that's a culmination of all of the depth of experience that I've, that I've had through the other roles. Yeah, great. Um, so Ria, I, just this might be a bit, uh, out of left field, but I'd love for you to think about 
um, your study with Griffith and cr criminology and what, what was your favourite subject and why? And just, <laughs> just as a, a warning to Tali and Corey, I'll be asking the, 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 this same question to you so you can sort of get prep, prep your answers a bit. What, what was your most, uh, what was your favourite subject, do you think? Um, I, I thought about this when I was watching um, the video earlier. So I think for me, it was the work placement towards the end. And the reason why is because I felt like that's when everything came together. Um, prior to that, um, I felt like I was a bit on a bit of a journey of where I should be heading. And I think there was a bit of imposter syndrome happening for me, um, you know, wondering where I was going to land and where I was going to fit and, you know, quite young as, as a young graduate straight out of high school. Um, so work placement for me and being fortunate enough to be placed with probation and parole, as it was known then, um, well, it wasn't even known then, it was probation and parole, I shall call it, um, was really great for me. Um, it felt like home. It felt like home really quickly and it felt like um, everything else fell into place. That's really interesting. So um, I'm possibly anticipating uh, uh, Tali, what, what would you say your favourite um, uh, subject was at universe at at uh, criminology. Oh, that's a tough one. And um, I think probably would be victimology. I really enjoyed that subject, and um, the the content was, whilst uh, you know difficult to, it was it was interesting, but obviously difficult uh, content that you're actually studying, but you're learning about, and you're really learning about. I guess how some offenders become offend offenders, how they start as victims themselves, but also you really start to understand how these, how victims are are treated by the criminal justice system, and it, it perpetuates. So it really, it actually, I, I'll give you a very quick example. It really the the bystander effect, and there was something that was discussed in one of our lectures with regards to you know witnessing something like domestic violence in some capacity. And not so long ago, I was actually on a train and I was witness, along with probably at least 15 other people to a, an event of domestic violence. And there was that point where I thought, no one is actually going to do anything. But I, I got up and I pressed the emergency button and I had three people turn around and look at me and say, thank you for doing that. So it was just something like that, that just, I know it's a really, abstract thing to put together for just an example, but there are that many great subjects at Griffith, but that one really stuck, stuck out for me. Yeah, and I think that's common that people uh, get these sort of threshold um, concepts through a, sort of a lived experience. And, and if you're able to apply what you learn through textbooks and in the exactly. classroom, uh, in, in, the, in the real world and observe some of the social forces that are at play, it just makes it a bit more, um, real, I guess. Um, uh, Corey, if we could turn to you, um, if you're able to uh, reach back into the depths of your memory and uh, think about some of your favourite subjects, what would you, if you were able to pick one subject that you that you found particularly uh, meaningful to you? I particularly enjoyed being a being a police officer at the time at university, and and there was a, a subject that challenged um, the role of police in society at the time. I don't think. It was a long time ago when I was studying, so the subjects have evolved a bit. Uh, but there was a common theme around um, having to analyse, you know, what is the role of police? Do they hold a special place in society? And it just made me question um, in myself and the career I was had just started in a really open and um, consultative way with a lot of other students. Um, it was mm. quite nice to feel that didn't matter who you were, um, you were accepted in that group and had a voice in the class. It was more the, the fact that you could have those discussions together with a lot of other people who normally wouldn't mix with police and police wouldn't mix with them. Um, and it challenged me personally. And Griffith had that annoying habit of doing that, of making you question, well, do I really know what I think I know or know who I, who, who I think I am? Um, and I think that contributed to a better outcome for me personally at the end of, the, at the end of study. Yeah, that's great. And it's, I guess it is quite confronting sometimes when your beliefs or prior, you know, expectations are, are challenged in a way. Um, and so to, to do that deftly is, is, can, be, can be something else. Um, so just turning to the next question in the chat, um, someone's asked, is work experience arranged by the university or could I arrange my own work placement? 
So we have uh, in our school a, uh, a placement program so where we will um, uh, match you with a, an agency and a, 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 a workplace supervisor. Um, you would be given a project to work on uh, and typically it's you would work on a, a day a week over a 12 week period and that you'd be working on a project of your own under the supervision of someone in industry. Um, it's a really, really popular uh, course. Um, it is competitive to get into it, but we're increasingly um, uh, resourcing that and finding more and more uh, opportunities for students. And that's in our third year. Once you've got the foundational knowledge in first year, we get you really good with your skills in second year and third year is all about sort of applying those skills. So thanks for your question. Um, uh, so Olivia asks, I was wondering what day to day work would look like and the kind of job kind of jobs you could get out of studying social work and criminology together. Um, so Olivia, um, you may or may not know this, but for the benefit of other people, we have uh, things called double degrees. So we have a single degree, Bachelor of Criminology and Criminal Justice. We also have double degrees that where we've paired with a discipline that's got a, uh, a sort of affiliation with criminology. So we have a, a criminology and a psych degree, a double degree, criminology and law, and we have one in a social work. It's called human services. The sorts of uh, jobs that you can get with the, and the advantage of double degrees, obviously, is you've got two different disciplines that you're kind of pairing together that, um, that is quite complementary. Um, the advantage of social work or the sorts of careers that you would attract uh, or you could go into from social work is largely around uh, victim services and victim support. But there's also um, other aspects in the um, uh, Queensland Corrective Services like probation and parole and sort of offender uh, offender management, client management uh, as well. Really broad, probably a really broad um, skill set. Uh, and I would think increasingly as you know, the trend in the workplace is towards automation uh, and machine learning. Um, you kind of wonder about these sort of human skills, soft skills that they're probably going to become more valuable um, in the coming years. Um, Suzanne asks, um, oh, Suzanne, uh, uh, Corey, this might be one for you. Uh, Corey, you sound like an excellent mentor with a developmental framework. Hope there are many, many like you within the area of law also. So, Corey, it, it would be interesting for you to reflect on how you've observed the Queensland Police Service change in its um, culture over the, the, the 35 years that you've, you've been with it? How, what sort of changes have you observed and what sort of, I guess, skills are now um, valued by QPS that may not have been um, uh, valued in the past? Uh, it's interesting that the question asked about, you know, what's happening in law because, you know, that the traditional adversarial relationship between um, legal professionals and police is kind of dissolving as we all realise that we've all got a part to play in getting a better outcome for people. So um, probably the greatest developmental thing that's happening and it's happening at a really fast rate now is that, um, you know, police officers going off and the organisation going off thinking that what they contribute is the be all and end all for a particular problem or a particular incident is slowly being proved as um, ineffectual. So we're really working um, quickly on how we partner and problem solve together with lawyers, with the justice system, with corrections, with micro projects that we work with closely because we've grow we're growing a more mature um, appreciation of the problem and a realization that you can't just be the police officer that kicks everyone bum and throws everyone in the watch house because the problems we're facing need a far greater um, approach than that. So police are becoming more consultative, they're becoming more collaborative, they're sharing information better to work across boundaries. You know, we're forming little teams on a on an operational basis to go forward and deal with problems together. And on the higher levels, you know, we're developing strategy and policies that complement each other instead of compete against each other or, or in fact, you know, uh, work in opposite directions. Yeah, I think you're right that um, often the police have in the past worked um, in, in counterproductive ways for other agencies. Um, shall we say that? Um, 
uh, someone has just asked, uh, I understand your degree is highly regarded by QPS and Queensland Government. Uh, is this degree regarded with Victorian-based services such as corrections, uh, police, etc.? So that's an interesting question. We have uh, at Griffith in criminology done um, online and distance learning for uh, it must be close to 15 years or no longer than that, probably closer to 20 years. Um, and that is, has drawn uh, students from all around Australia. So we have, we have lots of students that are interstate uh, and we have students that are in Victoria, New South Wales and, and in all of those criminal justice agencies. So in terms of um, definitely our degree isn't just a, a Queensland degree, um, it's heavily based on the Australian criminal justice system and, and legislation, but um, our graduates have had no problem getting positions in, in uh, agencies in other states. Uh, Ria, there's a, there's a question for you here. Um, what would you say is the most rewarding part of your job? Oh, that's a tough part. Um, I think it's the landing in a position where I feel valued and, and able to contribute all of the, the depth of learning from university all the way through my career to date. Um, knowing that I'm part of an organisation such as MICA fills my bucket. Um, I'm constantly amazed at the work that we're able to do, um, the way that we're able to be quite innovative. I think that's something that's always been driven within me through my studies as well. And what I appreciate from Griffith, it, Griffith is our ability to make innovation and research practical. Um, and I think MICA is the perfect example of how um, if, if we have areas of need in the community, Michael's a, Mike is able to adapt and, and respond so quickly um, and from a place of um, genuine human service need. Um, it's, it's just rewarding. I think that's the easiest way I can say. Um, I feel like I make a difference and the work that we do makes a difference and that certainly helps. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Corey, there's a question here that you, I, I'm going to have a, a crack at, but I'd be really interested in, in your take on it, because uh, I think you've got it, you're uniquely placed to answer this. So, uh, questions from Luke. Um, as someone who is interested in joining the police force, uh, sorry, it's j jumping around a bit. Um, as someone who is interested in joining the police force, is a Bachelor of CCJ better to study than a Cert for or Diploma in Crime and Justice at TAFE? So, we get this question a little bit, uh, or quite often, sorry. Um, my view is that what the police are really after are people that have got uh, lived experience, have real world uh, communication skills and are able to um, talk to and communicate and empathise with all strata of society. What a CCJ degree gives you is an understanding of criminal justice agencies, how they interact or how they function or dysfunction. Um, and just an understanding of criminality <clears throat> in different ways than uh, what a experienced police officer may, uh, may learn on the job. So I actually think, and, and, and often the police are interested in people with tertiary qualifications as it's a signifier of uh, being organised, being committed, dedicated, determined, etc. So I think I think a CCJ degree is very good at, at helping you get promoted once you're in the police uh, service. Um, but I don't think any particular study necessarily privileges you to get into um, a QPS or, or any police service. They're really after um, your sort of life skills, interpersonal skills. So Corey, I don't know how much of that you agree with or disagree, but I, I'd be interested in your take on, uh, on Luke's question. I'll, I'll, I'll just be a bit blunt. You get into the best value education you can get. And uh, if you can get into a, a proper university that's got a well-structured well structured educational pathway, connections to the organisations where you're likely to look for work, um, you take that with both hands. Uh, that really shows that uh, you, you're um, committed to learning how you learn and it establishes the connections for you going forward as far as, you know, what the work experience, the placements, the connection to people that are actually doing the job at the time. Um, so, you know, if I was giving advice to, uh, and I give it a lot to people that wanted to join the police to study, 
um, go for the highest level of qualification you can and show good evidence that you can apply yourself to that. Uh, and at the same time, get some life skills, um, go and do a crappy job dealing with people who are not happy, um, go and deal with people who are, that are, that, that are uh, you have to serve and you have to bite your tongue and you have to learn some humility. Um, go and volunteer in as many things you can and um, take yourself out of your comfort zone and up from your phone and go and meet some real people and together that will prepare you really well to get a job. Thanks, Corey. Um, next question is about opportunities for international students interested in studying criminology and criminal justice. Yeah, look, we, um, we do have international students in our program and I think what they benefit from is uh, some of our connections with uh, agencies. So we have got a very good relationship with QPS, they're long time uh, partners uh, with us, um, but equally Queensland Corrective Services, we, we've, been, um, we've been really strong supporters of them and, and, and they us. Um, I would point to when we had uh, the G20 um, in Brisbane, or was it the Gold Coast uh, in the last five years? I think it was 2015, maybe. We, we were able to create a placement opportunity for an international student to be part of uh, QPS's um, G20 operation, which I think is quite incredible for an international student to be involved in an operation of that scale is just something else. And that, that person's now gone, at, gone back to their home country and, and is a police officer in in their own country, which is just the, the experience that they must have taken, um, I, I just think would be really valuable. And they're still in touch with the police officers that they were serving under um, during G20. So the relationships kind of uh, stayed on. Um, the, the next question is, um, in regards to becoming a police investigator slash profiler, would following a path of criminology slash psychology dual degree, um, or is there a better path to that career? So that's a, that's a great question. Certainly, I think criminology, psychology is probably um, a really good combination. Um, but in all transparency, you know, psychology alone would, would probably suffice. Um, I should disclose that, that there really isn't a lot of jobs in profiling, despite what Hollywood might uh, and, and the TV might lead you to believe. There's actually and certainly in Australia, not really dedicated jobs called uh, profilers. There are people that do profiling work, but they also do other things as part of their day job. So it's very difficult. That is a difficult role to, to, to get. It's difficult to aim for. My advice is to do really well in your studies, get all the skills you can. And if you're a really good operator, opportunities will, will open for you, but it's gonna be hard to get that uh, in, in particular. Um, the looks like this might be the last question that we've got. Um, no, I think that might, that might be the last, I think we've run out of questions. I'll leave it open for, um, so this looks like it might be the last one we have from Piper. I am interested in intelligence. Would it be difficult working for ASIO? Piper, the thing to probably, my advice is to follow really closely the uh, the recruitment process it's that's done at the at the Commonwealth level and there's usually one round a year. The last time I was I looked at it, it was one round a year, and they they're looking at um, a whole range of different people. But um, political science is probably something that ASIO is is really interested, or it was when I was looking at ASIO. Um, there's a series of um, interviews. It's like a seven stage. Um, process. It, it's fairly arduous, but um, it, it, it is, um, you want to resign yourself to working in probably, I think it's a two year cadetship in Canberra where they'd get you to do a master's as well, uh, master's in political science, and then you'd probably be posted to one of the state offices for a period of time. You should probably resign yourself to um, moving around a lot as well. Okay, so there's a question for Corrections Satali. This, this might be you. Um, is there an age limit for joining Corrections? I've been volunteering at my courthouse for the last year. Good, well done. Um, working full time, studying full time and approaching graduation. And I would like to see my skills to transfer over to work in Corrections slash probation. 
I have a couple of blemishes on my police record from 20 years ago and would like to think it would hopefully not be a factor. Tali, well, you're, this, you're ideally placed as, a, as part of the recruitment team. What would you say to um, our, um, our questioner? Okay, yeah, so essentially, I'll start at the top. Age limit, absolutely no age limit. We have had people um, 70 plus apply and become successful. What I would suggest is, of course, understanding the recruitment process, particularly the fitness. So making sure you're prepared for the response to medical emergencies because it's not as easy as our video currently makes it out to be. And in terms of blemishes on a police record, so that's something that you need to be upfront and honest about when you submit an application. So that shows to us that you're operating with integrity, you're being honest, and every, every person has their criminal history check run through, through the system. And if we get a response saying, yes, you were uh, charged with XYZ, then that's when we start our process in terms of sending that off with all the documentation, with your uh, opportunity, if required, to respond to your previous offences. And the assistant commissioner will make a decision on whether you know, you may or may not be suitable for employment. So essentially, yeah, put an application in, have a look at our recruitment process, prepare for the training, the respond to medical emergencies, and uh, I wish you luck if you do decide to try and join GCS. Thanks, Tali. Yeah. Um, so we might, I think we've probably run out of time for this evening. Um, for those of you questions that we haven't got to, if um, I think there's a way that you can um, uh, join us in the, um, I think they're called Griffith Live Sessions, um, every Tuesday and Thursday um, from four to six, there's someone there that will be able to answer your questions. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining us. Um, I really appreciate uh, you setting aside some of your time to, to listen to us and give us some great questions. So, Appreciate that. I'd like to thank our three um, uh, uh, graduates who, who gave up some of their time today. So, Tali, thank you so much. And, and Ria, thanks for uh, making time. And of course, Corey, um, thank you so much for, um, for being here and answering our questions. Um, if you are interested in um, looking at this again, this session has been recorded. So, you'll be able to um, watch this or, or download it at um, uh, to watch later if you uh, if you would like um, but for now um, I can invite you to go to Griffith's um, virtual open house site and if you go into the booth um, you can um, uh, keep talking to us then um, our study advisors are also available uh, nine to five um, uh, weekdays or you can call uh, 1800 677 728 to speak to a um, a human live. Um, thanks a lot, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed this and we'll um, uh, all the best uh, with your future um, study decisions. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.